Welcome, and thank you for joining us. The topic today of our webinar is Current Trends in Prospectus Filings for Non-Investment Fund Reporting Issuers. My name is Christina Skocic, and I will be presenting today along with my colleagues Maria Lobscher, Ujala Matala, and Stephen O. Oh. Maria and Ujala are accountants in the Corporate Finance Branch at the OSC. Steve is Senior Legal Counsel in the Corporate Finance Branch, and I am Legal Counsel. As usual, we will be sending evaluation forms at the end of the session, and we'd appreciate your feedback on this format. We will also be sending continuous professional development certificates via email after the session as well. Before we begin, I'd like to remind participants that the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of the presenting staff and do not necessarily represent the views of the Commission or other Commission staff. The presentation is provided for general information purposes only and does not constitute legal or accounting advice. Information has been summarized and paraphrased for presentation purposes and the examples have been provided for illustration purposes only. Responsibility for making sufficient and appropriate disclosure and complying with applicable securities laws remains with the company. Information in this presentation reflects securities laws and other relevant standards that are in effect as of the date of the presentation. The contents of this presentation should not be modified without the express written permission of the presenters. So the objective of the OSC SME Institute is to support small and medium-sized businesses in facilitating cost-effective compliance through issuer outreach and education. It is important for issuers to know securities regulatory requirements and to help them navigate regulatory waters. The idea is that if we can help issuers to better understand disclosure requirements applicable to them, they can focus their resources on building their company. Ultimately, we both have the same goal, for issuers to provide appropriate and meaningful information to investors. It is important to remember that at the end of the day, investor confidence in the information that companies provide is critical to the success of the company. So we have a number of topics to cover today as outlined in this slide. We will be sharing our observations on the types of prospectuses and the standards of review conducted by our branch. We'll touch on various issues we frequently deal with, including the sufficiency of proceeds and financial condition issues, primary business, and how to deal with recent and probable acquisitions. We would also like to go over the required financial information and history in a prospectus, as well as briefly discuss some considerations when completing transactions involving related parties. We will also discuss issues related to cryptocurrency offerings. We have reserved some time for questions at the end of the presentation. You can submit questions at any time using the chat, chat function in the webinar. However, please note that we will be responding to all questions at the end of the presentation. First, let's begin with a general overview of the types of prospectuses that can be filed. Section 53 of the Ontario Securities Act states that no person or company shall trade in a security if the trade would be a distribution of the security unless a prospectus is filed and a receipt has been issued by the director. The corporate finance branch of the OSC reviews prospectuses filed by non-investment fund reporting issuers that cite Ontario as their principal regulator. We review these prospectuses for compliance with disclosure requirements as investors use these documents to make an investment decision on the offering. We also review these documents from a public interest perspective. The prospectus process allows us to scrutinize the document prior to the public relying on them. A prospectus can be a key investor protection tool. A prospectus can provide investors with important information about the company and the securities being offered. 
The information disclosed should both be comprehensive and entity specific. And provided the information disclosed is balanced and does not use boilerplate language, a prospectus should assist investors in evaluating the performance and risks of the company so they can make an informed investment decision. OSC staff conduct a review of the prospectus and issue comments to address disclosure deficiencies or other substantive issues. Note that we will discuss the prospectus filing and review process later on in the presentation. However, there are a number of possible outcomes from an offering document review and more than one outcome can be associated with a particular file. Possible outcomes from an offering document review include material disclosure changes, as well as the correction and refiling of significantly deficient continuous disclosure documents that an issuer incorporates by reference into a short form prospectus as a result of our review. After the review is complete and assuming all issues have been resolved, staff will generally recommend that the director issue a final receipt for the prospectus. However, there are a number of scenarios where Section 61 of the Ontario Securities Act provides that a director shall not issue a receipt. These include instances where there is one, substantial non-compliance with securities law requirements, two, the issuer's business may not be conducted with integrity and in the best interests of security holders because of past conduct of the officers and or directors, and three, the aggregate of proceeds from the offering and other resources of the issue, issuer are insufficient to achieve the stated purpose of the offering. We'll specifically discuss sufficiency of proceeds concerns later in the presentation. Apart from these instances, it is generally expected that a director will issue a receipt unless the director believes it is not in the public interest to do so. When a reporting issuer is raising money in the public markets, a prospectus must be filed with securities regulatory authorities. A reporting issuer may also distribute securities privately pursuant to prospectus exemptions. For example, commonly used prospectus exemptions include the accredited investor exemption, the friends and family exemption, and the crowdfunding exemption. <clears throat> These and other prospectus exemptions are set out in National Instrument 45106 prospectus exemptions. For a more detailed overview of raising funds in the exempt market, please see the SME Institute presentation from January 25th, 2017 entitled Financing Options for SMEs, Tips and Tools for Raising Money in the Public and Private Markets, which is available on the OSC's YouTube channel. <coughs> so there are various types of prospectuses that an issuer may file. I will briefly describe each of them. A long-form prospectus is used by a company completing an initial offering of its securities, commonly referred to as an initial public offering or IPO, or by a company that is not eligible to use a short-form prospectus. Small and medium-sized enterprises that do not have a current annual information form are generally required to file a long-form prospectus. From the date the preliminary long-form prospectus receives a receipt, from the director, the, pr the principal regulator has 10 business days to conduct a full review and issue comments. Companies must comply with the specific disclosure requirements set out in National Instrument 41101 and Form 41101F1. For an initial public offering, a company becomes a reporting issuer following the issuance of a final receipt on its prospectus. And going forward, will be subject to continuous disclosure, which I will refer to as CD, obligations pursuant to National Instrument 51102 Continuous Disclosure Obligations. A short form prospectus is used by a company that is already a reporting issuer in a Canadian jurisdiction and by issuers who meet the eligibility requirements that are set out in National Instrument 44101. These requirements include an existing CD record and equity securities listed on a qualified exchange. 
When filed, short form prospectuses go through a screening process and are either assigned to a basic review, an issue oriented review, or a full review. Generally, staff has three business days to issue comments in the context of a short form prospectus. A short form prospectus must comply with National Instrument 44101 and Form 44101F1, which allows existing reporting issuers to incorporate certain information into a prospectus by reference, including <coughs> financial statements and management's discussion and analysis, or MDNA, its annual information form, or AIF, subject to certain exception, exceptions, sorry, its management information circular, material change reports, and business acquisition reports. The short form prospectus rules also allow for the deemed incorporation by reference of all documents filed after the final receipt, but before completion of the distribution. These documents would form part of the prospectus and attract liability. A base shelf prospectus is a form of prospectus used by a company that is already a reporting issuer. The disclosure required in this type of prospectus is essentially the same as for a short form prospectus. However, National Instrument 44102 allows for certain modifications. If a reporting issuer is eligible to file a short form prospectus, then it also meets the technical eligibility requirements to file a base shelf prospectus. Note that there are some instances in which the use of a base shelf prospectus may not be appropriate, and we will discuss these later in the presentation. A short form base shelf prospectus allows a reporting issuer to qualify and distribute various types of securities over a 25 month period up to the indicated ag aggregate dollar value of securities shown in the final base shelf prospectus. A single base shelf prospectus can include multiple types of securities, including, for example, common shares, units, warrants, subscription receipts, and debt securities. This form of offering allows a company to access the capital markets quickly because it can draw down the aggregate amount indicated in the base shelf prospectus by filing a prospectus supplement that includes the details of the offering. A base shelf prospectus is a cost effective way for issuers to access the public markets. <coughs> Pursuant to National Instrument 44102, certain information relating to a particular offering may be omitted from the base shelf prospectus, provided that it is included in the prospectus supplement that is filed and delivered when the actual distribution of securities occurs. A post receipt pricing prospectus or PREP prospectus allows a reporting issuer to obtain a receipt for a final prospectus without pricing details. A supplemented PREP is then filed containing the pricing information. This type of prospectus is generally used by reporting issuers doing a cross-border financing since it allows Canadian dealers to coordinate timing with their U.S. counterparts. The Canada-US Multi-Jurisdictional Disclosure System, MJDS, was adopted in 1991 by the Canadian Securities Administrators, or CSA, and the US Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC. The MJDS is a disclosure system that enables eligible cross-border securities offerings to be governed by the disclosure requirements of the issuer's home country. MJDS is mostly used by international issuers who are offering securities and have a shareholder base in Canada and in the US. In terms of offerings, MJDS has two parts. A southbound MJDS is used by eligible Canadian reporting issuers who meet MJDS requirements to sell their securities into the US. And a northbound MJDS is used by eligible US issuers to sell their securities into Canada. 
The southbound MJDS offering process can be attractive to eligible Canadian reporting issuers for two main reasons. First, an eligible Canadian issuer can offer securities in the United States using a Canadian prospectus that is subject to review only by the Canadian securities regulators and not by the SEC. This can be helpful to issuers from a timing perspective. Also, Canadian reporting issuers who meet MJDS requirements, which are set forth in National Instrument 71101, are permitted to file a Canadian short form prospectus in both Canada and the US. These rules are similar for US issuers filing in Canada under National Instrument 71101. There are generally six types of offerings available to issuers. The first and very frequent type of offering is a bought deal. A bought deal is where underwriters price the deal and sign a firm commitment with the issuer to buy the base amount of securities four days prior to filing a preliminary prospectus. A preliminary prospectus must then be filed not more than four days after the entering into of the underwriting agreement. An overnight marketed deal begins when an issuer filing a preliminary prospectus receives a receipt. Then the underwriters market the deal overnight at the close of the market on the date a preliminary receipt is issued. The next morning, the underwriters will price the deal and sign a firm commitment to buy a base amount of the offering. An amended and restated preliminary prospectus is then filed with size and pricing information provided. For a fully marketed underwritten deal, the underwriters will price the deal and sign a firm commitment to buy a base amount of the offering on the eve of filing the final prospectus after marketing the offering. This is usually the scenario in an initial public offering. And there are two types of best efforts agency offerings. The first is where the agent must sell between a minimum and maximum dollar value of securities. The second is where the agent will sell the offering using best efforts, but the deal is not contingent on a minimum dollar value being sold. Given that the agent is selling the offering using its best efforts, the agent is not liable to buy any unsold securities. So for the next two types of offerings, in our experience, they are not frequently used. In a special warrant offering, Special warrants are issued to investors pursuant to an exemption from the prospectus requirements before a prospectus is filed. The special warrants are convertible into underlying securities of the issuer, for example, common shares, and the reporting issuer is required to file a prospectus to qualify the distribution, distribution of underlying securities. The last type of prospectus to discuss are non-offering prospectuses. Issuers who choose to file a non-offering prospectus often do so in order to become a reporting issuer. Non-offering prospectuses do not involve the selling of any securities to the public. For example, pursuant to the Special Purpose Acquisition Corporation program of the TSX, a SPAC would file a non-offering prospectus at the time of its qualifying acquisition containing disclosure of the target. Thanks, Christina. I'd now like to move on to discuss the prospectus filing and review process. This is meant to give an overview of what can be expected when filing a prospectus with the Ontario Securities Commission. We'll go through the topics listed on this slide. This slide provides an overview of the process, including the steps that are taken before a final receipt is issued. As you can see, an issuer would start off by determining the principal regulator, then file a pre-file or application if applicable, and I will discuss this in more detail in a minute, followed by filing a preliminary prospectus. As Christina mentioned, a preliminary prospectus will be reviewed by OSC staff and, and comments may be issued. 
Once all of the comments are addressed, the issuer would be cleared to file a final prospectus. After review of the final prospectus and associated documents, a final receipt would be issued. An issuer needs to determine its principal regulator. You can refer to National Policy 11202, Process for Prospectus Reviews in Multiple Jurisdictions, for more guidance on how to determine the principal regulator. Generally, the location of an issuer's head office will be determinative if the head office is in one of the specified jurisdictions listed on the slide. However, in a situation where an issuer's head office is not located in a specified jurisdiction, the other listed factors will be relevant in determining with which of the specified jurisdictions the issuer has the most significant connection. In the event that there are certain novel aspects to the file or a significant or unique matter that an issuer feels should be discussed with the regulator before a preliminary prospectus is filed, we generally encourage issuers to pre-file with us so that these issues can be addressed. Some of the reasons and benefits of pre-filing include to seek relief from a requirement under securities law, to consult with staff as to how securities legislation may be interpreted in particular circumstances. It is generally done prior to or concurrently with filing of a preliminary prospectus. It's done to avoid surprises during the comment period. And it is important to keep in mind that the length of time required depends on the complexity and novelty of the issues. Pre-filings and applications are reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis and are dependent on the specific facts and circumstances. We generally do not consider time and cost as reasons for non-compliance with the prospectus requirements. We do consult with the other CSA jurisdictions on novel issues, which is another reason why any novel aspect should be pre-filed. Lastly, in the event that relief from certain requirements is granted, we would expect a description of the relief to be disclosed in the prospectus. The next step in the process is to file the preliminary prospectus. It is important to properly file all of the applicable documents. This includes English and French translation of the prospectus, if applicable, qualification certificates, materials incorporated by reference, documents affecting the rights of security holders, which could include bylaws, material contracts, and reports, valuations, and mining reports. Documents that are required to be delivered include personal, personal information forms and related authorizations, an auditor's comfort letter, and an issuer confirmation letter pursuant to section 7.2 of National Policy 11202. These documents are not made public on CEDAR, but rather delivered to the principal regulator to complete the review. The items on this slide should be considered when filing the materials associated with a preliminary prospectus. So whether the filings are in substantive compliance with the requirements. You can find references to form requirements in the appendix to this presentation. The date of the prospectus should coincide with the date of filing within three days. If all required documents are properly filed and delivered before noon, a receipt of the preliminary prospectus would generally be issued on that day. It is important to note that if there is a material adverse change to the prospectus, an amended and restated preliminary prospectus should be filed to incorporate those changes. Christina already mentioned the timeframes for which a comment letter should be expected, but it is also shown on this slide. So some tips for responding to comment letters include making sure the responses comprehensively address staff's comments, to cite authoritative references where appropriate, especially when responding to technical accounting comments, 
and to provide proposed disclosure to be included in, in the prospectus to address staff's comments where appropriate. So similar to preliminary prospectus filings, these are the required filings for the final prospectus, which include the English and French translation of the prospectus, if, if applicable, the materials incorporated by reference, documents affecting the rights of security holders, material contracts, any reports or valuations, and any undertakings, submissions to jurisdictions, and experts' consents. The documents required to be delivered include a black line to show the changes from the preliminary prospectus and the conditional approval letter from the exchange. Other considerations for filing a final prospectus include the time between the date of the preliminary prospectus and the date of the final prospectus. In order to receive receipt of a final prospectus, the final materials need to be filed before noon on that day. Furthermore, any issues noted in the filings could delay the final receipt. It is important to keep in mind that if there is a material that if a material change occurs after the filing of the final prospectus, but before the completion of the distribution under the final prospectus, then an amendment to the final prospectus should be filed in order to incorporate these changes. Now I'll move on to discuss some common areas of concern that we come across during prospectus reviews. I'll start off on the topic of expected disclosures in the use of proceeds section of a prospectus, as we tend to see some common pitfalls in the disclosure in this area. This section of the prospectus requires disclosure of the actual proceeds under the offering, this being net of expenses, so the actual proceeds that the issuer expects to receive. In the case where there is a minimum and a maximum, the net proceeds under each would also be required here. In this section, an issuer must also disclose each of the principal purposes of the offering with approximate amounts for which the net proceeds will be used. We expect issuers to provide sufficient detail and to be comprehensive in their discussion. For example, generic phrases such as for general corporate purposes would be viewed as insufficient disclosure. We generally expect an itemized description of how the proceeds will be used and an approximate allocation to each item. In addition, an issuer should state the business objectives that the issuer expects to accomplish using the net proceeds of the distribution. This disclosure should include the concrete development milestones that would advance the issuer's business objectives and are expected to be completed in the next 12 months, including a description of each milestone, as well as the expected timing of completion and the financing requirements for each objective or milestone. For example, if the issuer intends to use the proceeds of the offering to complete clinical trials, the issuer should describe the milestone how the milestone would advance the issuer's business objectives. For example, if the clinical trials are successful, the issuer would then be in a position to file for FDA or Health Canada approvals, how long the clin clinical trials will take to complete, and the expected total cost. It is important to reconcile the allocation of the proceeds to the milestone with the expected cost of the milestone. For example, if the issuer has allocated $1 million of the proceeds of the offering to the clinical trials, but the clinical trials will cost $1.3 million to complete, an issuer should indicate what other sources of funding are available to the issuer in order to bridge that gap, which may, for example, be cash on hand. This slide provides an example of where staff are likely to view the description as insufficient disclosure regarding the use of proceeds. It states that the net proceeds under the offering is $5 million. The proceeds of the offering will be used towards general corporate purposes, expansion of a production facility, and potential strategic acquisitions. 
And so as you can see, this does not provide an allocation or enough details to provide investors with the information required to gain a fulsome understanding of the use of proceeds. However, as you can see on this slide, it provides much more detail about the use of proceeds and an itemized description and allocation for which the proceeds are intended to be used towards. In this slide, it states that the net proceeds under the offering are estimated to be $5 million net of fees. $4.2 million is allocated to a facility expansion, which is intended to expand our widget production facility which is estimated to be completed in Q3 2018, and which we estimate will cost 4.2 million. The expansion is expected to increase capacity from 1,000 widgets per month to 1,500 widgets per month, and will help us reach our target revenue growth. And 800,000 is allocated to advertising and marketing. And because given the planned increase in capacity and increased demand, we plan to expand our current online and print advertising to support the increased capacity. So you can see that this provides investors with detailed information about the use of proceeds. And I'll pass it on to Ujala to take you through sufficiency of proceeds. Thank you, Maria. I'll now move on to the topic of sufficiency of proceeds and concerns regarding the financial condition of an issuer in the context of a prospectus filing. The financial condition of an issuer and the sufficiency of proceeds from the offering are key areas that staff is alert for and considers in each prospectus review. In terms of the relevant regulations, securities legislation in Canada provides that the decision maker which in this case would be the Director of Corporate Finance, shall not issue a receipt for a prospectus or an amendment to a prospectus in specified circumstances. In particular, a decision maker is prohibited from issuing a receipt for a prospectus if it appears that the proceeds from the prospectus offering, along with the issuer's other resources, will be insufficient to accomplish the purpose of the issue stated in the prospectus. As noted earlier, there may be receipt refusal concerns when it appears that the prospectus inadequately discloses an issuer's financial condition and going concern risk, or there is adequate disclosure about the issuer's financial condition, but it appears that either the sufficiency of proceeds receipt refusal provision as outlined on this slide is applicable, or that it is not in the public interest to issue the receipt. Therefore, a critical part of our review of every prospectus is considering the issuer's financial condition and the intended use of the proceeds. Areas we consider as part of our review include, can the issuer reach the next milestone in their development plan? Does the issuer have enough money for exploration work, working capital requirements, and any repayments of debt coming due in the near term? I'll note that our expectations depend on the stage of operations the issuer is in. For example, we have different expectations for fully oper operational company that is earning revenues as compared to a research and development stage company. I will discuss this in further detail later in the presentation. When conducting prospectus reviews, we may consider the anticipated proceeds from a prospectus offering to be insufficient in several cases. For example, we may consider the proceeds to be insufficient if they are raised for a specific purpose but do not address the issuer's short-term liquidity requirements. We may also view the proceeds as being insufficient if they will be raised through a best efforts offering without a minimum subscription amount or a minimum subscription that does not appear to be sufficient to satisfy the issuer's short-term liquidity requirements. Additionally, we may have concerns when an issuer files a base shelf prospectus, which can be drawn down in small increments, 
because when considered separately, the individual drawdowns may not be sufficient to satisfy the issuer's short-term liquidity requirements. So why do we focus on sufficiency of proceeds in our reviews? A principal purpose of the sufficiency of proceeds receipt refusal provision is to protect the integrity of the capital markets, which would be harmed if an issuer ceased operations due to insufficient funds shortly after completing a public securities offering. So what are we looking for? We want issuers to be able to demonstrate that they have sufficient resources to meet their short-term liquidity requirements. The relevant time frame for this will vary depending on the type of issuer. Some guidelines are included in, this in the table on this slide. As shown, an exploration stage issuer should have sufficient resources to, complete, to reach completion of the next phase of a project. A development stage issuer should have sufficient resources to, to achieve their next significant milestone. A research and development issuer should have sufficient resources to achieve progress on the development of a key product. And an issuer with active operations should have sufficient resources to continue operations for the short term, which staff usually view as 12 months from the date of the prospectus. As you may know, issuers have different options available to them in terms of the form of prospectus that they file. We are going to take a look at some concerns related to sufficiency of proceeds and financial condition that may arise when issuers choose to file a base shelf prospectus. As a reminder, a base shelf prospectus can only be used by a company that is already a reporting issuer. It allows companies to access the capital markets quickly because they can draw down or raise small amounts of capital in increments for up to 25 months. Therefore, many issuers see it as a cost-effective way of accessing markets. However, staff may take the view that a base shelf prospectus is not appropriate given the issuer's financial condition and uncertainty of financing particularly when the issuer does not have sufficient funds at the time of filing of the base shelf prospectus to meet obligations for the next 12 months or its next significant milestone as applicable. When staff has these type of concerns, we may request submissions in a number of areas as outlined on this, on this slide, such as the issuer's rationale for filing a base shelf prospectus, whether the issuer intends to file a prospectus supplement in the near future, and if so, the type of securities to be offered, the proceeds that are contemplated to be raised, and how they will be used. The availability of other sources of financing to provide working capital and fund the issuer's business if sufficient financing cannot be raised. The proposed nature and timing of the offering under a base shelf prospectus including any involvement of an agent or underwriter, use of a minimum subscription amount below which an offering will not proceed, the specific use of proceeds for offerings contemplated in the next 12 months, and details regarding concrete development milestones that would advance the issuer's business objectives and are expected to be completed in the next 12 months. In order to address the the concern that incremental drawdowns may be insufficient to satisfy an issuer's short-term liquidity requirements, we may request that the issuer do a number of things, including changing the structure of the deal by withdrawing the base shelf prospectus and instead following a short-form prospectus with a minimum subscription amount that is sufficient to meet the issuer's short-term liquidity requirements, or following a short-form prospectus with a fully underwritten commitment. We may also ask the issuer to arrange for additional sources of financing to satisfy our concerns. Keep in mind that each situation is different and staff will evaluate the individual circumstances of a particular file to determine, to determine the acceptable course in that situation. Now, let's touch briefly on the relevant disclosure when staff have has concerns over the financial condition of the issuer. 
A prospectus must contain clear disclosure on how the issuer intends to use the proceeds raised in the offering, as well as, as a disclosure of the issuer's financial condition, including any liquidity concerns. This disclosure is important to investors because it provides warnings about significant risks that the issuer is facing or may face in the short term and may help investors avoid or mi minimize negative consequences when making investment decisions. In particular, the issuer must disclose if it has had negative cash flows from operations in the most recent annual audited financial statements that are included or incorporated by reference in the prospectus, as well as corresponding risk disclosure. Other relevant information in this context may include disclosure of working capital deficiencies, historical net losses, and significant going concern risks including the presence of a going concern note in the issuer's historical financial statements that are included in the prospectus. However, I'd like to highlight the fact that disclosure on its own may not be sufficient to satisfy receipt refusal concerns in certain circumstances. In other words, if the proceeds are insufficient to accomplish the purpose of the issue, this would give rise to a receipt refusal concern regardless of the disclosure. The final slide in this section is provided primarily as a reference slide. It includes some of the specific provisions that are applicable to the disclosure required in a prospectus regarding the use of proceeds and financial condition of the issuer. I would highlight that CSA staff have previously issued a comprehensive staff notice, Staff Notice 41307, which outlines our approach where where there are concerns regarding the financial condition of an issuer and or the sufficiency of proceeds in a prospectus offering. The staff notice also describes issues that have arisen in past prospectus reviews and explains the type of comments that we have raised about an issuer's financial condition and or the sufficiency of proceeds. It is a key resource that issuers can use to understand staff's approach in this area. The staff notice is available on the OFC website. Now Maria will discuss financial statement considerations. Thanks, Ujala. So starting with the financial history for an IPO in a long form prospectus, there are a few questions to consider. The first is, what periods of financial history are required for an IPO prospectus? Item 32 of Form 41101-F1 describes the financial statement disclosure required in IPO prospectuses. The amount of financial history differs slightly between non-venture and IPO venture issuers, which I will discuss in more detail on the next slide. The other important item to consider is what actually comprises the issuer's entire business. An issuer needs to consider the business that investors are investing in, even if this financial history spans across multiple legal entities over those periods. So what exactly does that mean? Were there any businesses that were acquired over the periods that a reasonable investor would regard as being in the same primary business of the issuer? If so, the acquired business would then be considered to be part of the issuer going forward, and therefore, financial history of that acquired business is required. Similarly, is there a proposed acquisition on the horizon that a reasonable investor would regard as being in the same primary business of the issuer? If so, the issuer would need to provide financial history of the proposed acquisition as it would be part of the business of the issuer going forward. In instances where there are multiple acquisitions in the same primary business of the issuer, we encourage issuers and their advisors to consult staff on a pre-file basis to consider if financial statements of any of the smaller immaterial acquisitions could potentially be excluded from the prospectus via exemptive relief. This slide summarizes the general financial statement requirements under item 32 of form 41101F1 as it pertains to the length of financial history required. As I mentioned earlier, there are slight differences between what is required for IPO venture issuers and for non-venture issuers. In terms of annual financial statements, 
Non-venture issuers are generally required to provide a statement of comprehensive income, statement of changes in equity, and statement of cash flows for each of the three most recently completed financial years and a statement of financial position as at the end of the two most recently completed financial years. This applies to financial years ended more than 90 days before the date of the prospectus. IPO venture issuers are generally required to provide a statement of comprehensive income, statement of changes in equity, and statement of cash flows for each of the two most recently completed financial years and are still required to provide a statement of financial position as at the end of the two most recently completed financial years. This applies to financial years ended more than 90 days before the date of the prospectus. In terms of interim financial statements, both IPO venture and non-venture issuers are generally required to provide interim financial statements for the most recently completed interim period after the most recent financial year. This applies to interim periods that ended more than 45 days before the date of the prospectus for non-venture issuers and for IPO venture issuers. When preparing for an IPO, it is important to understand the financial statement audit requirement as it relates to financial statements under item 32 or the issuer's primary business. National Instrument 41101 General Prospectus Requirements provides details on the audit requirement for issuers. Generally, any financial statements included in the IPO or long-form prospectus must be audited in accordance with National Instrument 52107 acceptable accounting principles and auditing standards, unless an exception applies. Exceptions to this requirement are found in section 32.5 of form 41101F1. The most commonly used exceptions include interim financial statements. The most recent interim financial statements included in the prospectus after the most recently completed financial year are not required to be audited. Annual financial statements for the second and third most recently completed financial years of a junior issuer, and junior issuer is defined under National Instrument 41101, General Prospectus Requirements. If an auditor has not issued an auditor's report on those financial statements, and the financial statements for the most recently completed financial year is not less than 12 months in length. So now I'd like to turn our attention to the financial statements required in a short form prospectus. As Christina mentioned, basic requirements for filing a short form prospectus include being an existing reporting issuer. And therefore, an issuer filing a short form prospectus would have a continuous disclosure history. This means that there are certain mandatory items which need to be incorporated by reference into the prospectus. In terms of financial statements, this includes the issuer's current annual financial statements with the comparative period, and the issuer's most recently filed interim financial statements. It is important to note that for the purposes of the prospectus, the interim financial statements need to be reviewed as prescribed under Part 4.3 of 44101 Alternative Forms of Prospectus. For any completed or probable acquisitions that are determined to be significant, Per the tests found under Part 8 of National Instrument 51102, Continuous Disclosure Obligations, then the financial statements that would be included in a business acquisition report or satisfactory alternative financial statements would be required in the prospectus. An issuer must determine whether the acquisition is probable at, at the time of the prospectus and would include a, any proposed acquisition that has progressed to a state where a reasonable person would believe that the likelihood of the issuer completing the acquisition is high. This is a very important factor to think about as offerings done to raise capital in order to complete an acquisition could potentially require financial statement disclosure of that proposed acquisition. This slide also summarizes the significance tests used to determine whether an acquisition is significant. Note that the thresholds are different for venture and non-venture issuers. As you can see, for non-venture issuers, there are three tests, including the asset test, investment test, and profit or loss test. If any one of these tests apply, the acquisition is deemed significant for reporting purposes, and additional reporting 
requirements apply. For venture issuers, the same is true. However, only the asset and investment tests apply and the thresholds are different. Details of how to calculate and determine the significance thresholds can be found under Part 8.3 of National Instrument 52102. Sorry, 51102. We'll now turn our attention to forward-looking information, or FLI as commonly known, as this is an area in which we've recently seen an increase in use in prospectuses and related marketing materials. We did briefly touch on FLI during our CD session in December. However, given the increased use of FLI in prospectuses and marketing materials, we thought it would be a good idea to review the obligations and as the obligations associated with presenting FLI in the context of prospectuses. A good starting point is to determine what FLI is. This slide provides a good overview of what is considered to be FLI, which is generally disclosure about possible events, conditions, or financial performance that is based on assumptions about future economic conditions and courses of action. It is relatively broad. As you can see on the chart, FLI includes two subcategories dealing with financial information. The first is forward-looking financial information, or FOFI, and the second is financial outlook. Both FOFI and financial outlooks are subsets of FLI that are related to prospective financial performance, financial position or cash flows, which are based on assumptions about future economic conditions and courses of action. The difference between FOFI and financial outlook is a format in which the financial information is presented. In the case of FOFI, the information is presented in the format of historical financial statements, while it is not for a financial outlook. Examples of financial outlook could include projected EBITDA, expected revenue, profit or loss, EPS, or R&D spending. When we see FOFI, it is generally found in prospectuses or rights offerings. In addition, we have seen disclosure that doesn't necessarily fit into the definition of FOFI or financial outlook, but that we would deem as FLI. An example of that would be an estimate of future store openings by an issuer in the retail industry. We've seen a lot of this type of FLI in IPO prospectuses as issuers hope to convey their growth strategy within the prospectus or marketing materials. We will now review key considerations and expectations when disclosing FLI. Is the FLI identified? For example, has the issuer noted that projected revenue is forward-looking information? Is there a reasonable basis for the disclosed FLI? In determining what constitutes a reasonable basis for FLI, a reporting issuer con should consider the reasonableness of the assumptions underlying the FLI and the process followed in preparing and reviewing the FLI, as this could be misleading if not disclosed and not very useful. Are assumptions supporting financial outlook and FOFI reasonable, entity specific, and disclosed? Does the issuer disclose what the assumptions are that support the projected revenues? Is the FLI presented for a reasonable period? Has the issuer presented target revenue for multiple years? Have issuers been cautioned that actual results may vary from disclosed FLI? Have the risk factors that could cause actual results to vary been identified? This is a key point. Updating previously disclosed FLI helps investors understand how actual results will differ materially from FLI and how the reporting issuer is progressing in relation to its plan. If events or circumstances occur which make it unlikely that material FLI will be achieved in the future, then there is a responsibility to provide an update. And finally, have material differences between actual results and previously disclosed financial outlook and FOFI been disclosed? I just wanted to highlight an example related to disclosing FLI over, the, over a lengthy future period. In the example, five years, without providing the underlying assumptions to support the FLI. 
In this example, the company simply discloses its 2017 actuals, which include revenue of 10 million, EBITDA of 2 million, and number of physical storefronts of 36. In the same table, the company discloses targets that are five years out, or 2023 targets, showing significant growth of revenue, EBITDA, and the number of physical storefronts. So as you can see, this disclosure does not provide the underlying assumptions to support the growth targets disclosed. This is the same example, but modified to contain detailed assumptions underlying the revenue growth target. Note that the assumptions underlying the EBITDA and store location targets are also required. However, for the purposes of this example, I will just one, run through revenue. As you can see in this example, instead of disclosing targets that are five years out, the growth targets were reduced to two years. As in this case, two years was determined to be a reasonable time period, and the reasons for that are described as well. A growth target of five years, though in certain circumstances could be reasonable, should be considered very carefully, as it is difficult to reasonably project out five years and provide assumptions for a five-year target. Furthermore, a company would need to consider the requirement to update the FLI in its MDNA. As you can see in this slide, the 2018 revenue target is 12 million and the 2019 revenue target is 14.5 million. This implies a growth rate of approximately 20% each year. As described in the slide, this growth target is consistent with the cumulative annual growth rate achieved over the 2014 to 2017 period. In addition, the company has signed lease agreements in both 2018 and 2019 for new store openings, which is a key reason why growth in revenue is projected for these years. This example provides investors with a clear understanding of how the company intends to reach its growth targets. In addition, an investor can use their own judgment in assessing the reasonability of the growth targets based on the assumptions and can clearly reconcile any differences in subsequent MDNA, MDNA filings when the company updates its FLI. I'll now pass it on to Christina to take us through the topic of audit committees and conflict of interest transactions. Thank you, Maria. So with respect to audit committees, a reporting issuer's audit committee is responsible for the oversight of its financial reporting process and managing the relationship between the issuer and the external auditors. For a non-reporting issuer that files an IPO prospectus, it should be in place before the receipt for the final IPO prospectus is issued. We'd like to remind issuers that National Instrument 52110 applies to both corporate and non-corporate entities. For example, in the case of a limited partnership, the directors of the general partner who are independent of the limited partnership, including the general partner, should form an audit committee. National Instrument 52110 generally requires every member of an audit committee to be independent However, venture reporting issuers are exempt from certain aspects of the rule, including those found in Parts 3, Composition of the Audit Committee, and Part 5, Reporting Obligations. We strongly suggest issuers review National Instrument 52110 to ensure requirement, uh, compliance sorry, with its requirements. So moving on to conflict of interest transactions. Multilateral Instrument 61101, Protection of Security Holders in Special Situations, regulates transactions that may raise conflict of interest concerns because the transactions occur between the company and its related parties. We note that Multilateral Instrument 61101 applies to all TSX and TSX Venture listed companies. The rule is meant to protect the interests of minority shareholders when mergers and or acquisition transactions are proposed in which a significant shareholder or other insider could have an advantage by virtue of voting power, board representation, or preferential, preferential access to information. The underlying principle of the rule is that all security holders be treated in a manner that is fair and that is perceived to be fair. 
In addition to share acquisitions, multilateral instrument 61101 also regulates significant related party transactions that are in substance change of control type transactions. Multilateral instrument 61101 applies to four types of transactions. First, related party transactions. These are a specified type of transaction between the issuer and a significant shareholder or other related party of the issuer. Second, insider bids. These involve a takeover bid by an insider of the issuer, for example, a director, officer, or 10% voting security holder. The third type of transaction is an issuer bid. An issuer bid is an acquisition by the issuer of its own securities. The last type of transaction is a business combination, which is otherwise known as a going private transaction. A business combination is a transaction whereby an equity security holder is required to sell or exchange its securities without its consent, and a related party of the issuer is either the acquirer of the securities or is receiving preferential treatment under the terms of the transaction. There are three main requirements for conflict of interest transactions set out in Multilateral six, Instrument 61101. The first is enhanced disclosure. 61101 sets out specific disclosure requirements that must be made in connection with a conflict transaction. The second requirement is for the issuer to, to obtain independent valuation of the transaction. The third is for the issuer to obtain minority shareholder approval at a meeting of shareholders. Issuers can find helpful guidance on the role of directors and the independent committee review in the companion policy to Multilateral Instrument 61101 and the recently issued multi Multilateral CSA Staff Notice 61302 Staff Review and Commentary on Multilateral Instrument 61101. So with respect to enhanced disclosure, in the context of a conflict of interest transaction, it is possible that certain individuals may have access to more information than regular shareholders. To combat this, Multilateral Instrument 61101 sets out detailed disclosure rules to reduce the information asymmetry between insiders and minority shareholders. The document disclosing a conflict of interest transaction typically must include a description of the background of the bid or the material terms of the transaction, a discussion of the review and approval process adopted by the board of directors or special committee in determining the merits of the transaction, disclosure of any bona fide prior offer received or prior valuation made within the last 24 months, and a formal valuation or disclosure of the exemption being relied upon Note that if an issuer is relying on an exemption from the formal valuation and or the minority approval requirement, the disclosure document should provide a reasonable, ba reasonable basis on which to conclude that the exemption is available. <laughs> Multilateral instrument 61101 requires an issuer to obtain a formal valuation of the subject matter of the transaction, which in the case of an insider bid or issuer bid, is the offeree securities, in the case of a business combination, the affected securities, and any non-cash consideration being offered or to be received by the holders of securities, and the non-cash assets involved in the related party transaction. The board of directors or the independent committee will choose the valuator and should supervise the preparation of the valuation. Part six of multilateral instrument 61101 sets out the independence and qualifications of the, valuer, of the valuator. Specifically, the party conducting the valuation must be independent of all interested parties to the transaction. For example, using the issuer's advisor or external auditor is not appropriate since these parties will not be independent. The rule also contemplates that if the valuator is being rewarded with a success fee, that this may affect the perceived independence of the valuator. Please note that the, that the rule requires specific disclosure about the valuation and the valuator in the disclosure document, 
and all prior valuations must be disclosed in certain circumstances. Multilateral Instrument 61101 also requires that issuers obtain minority approval from shareholders for business combinations and related party transactions. This is often referred to as the majority of the minority shareholders. The minority shareholder class is determined by excluding votes attached to shares held by the issuer, any interested party, any related party of interested parties, or joint actors. We note that generally, a party is not an interested party if it is treated identically to other shareholders and is not entitled to receive a collateral benefit. An issuer involved in any of the types of transactions regulated by multilateral instrument 61101 should provide sufficient information to security holders to enable them to make an informed decision. As such, the directors of the issuer should disclose their reasonable beliefs as to the desirability or fairness of the proposed transaction and make useful recommendations regarding the transaction. We note that a statement that the directors are unable to make or are not making a recommendation regarding the transaction without any detailed reasons generally would not be viewed as, as sufficient disclosure. The disclosure given to shareholders should include an assessment and discussion of the formal valuation and any prior valuation of the issuer. We note that the board process is an area of special focus for the Office of Mergers and Acquisitions. OMA staff review material conflict of interest transactions on a real-time basis to assess compliance with the requirements of multilateral instrument 61101 and to determine whether a transaction raises potential public interest concerns. OMA staff review, the, sorry, the OMA staff review focuses on compliance with disclosure requirements, compliance with the conditions for exemptions in multilateral instrument 61101 from the formal valuation and minority approval requirements, and the substance and disclosure of the process conducted by an issuer's board of directors or special committee in considering a material conflict of interest transaction. Also note that any complaints received by OMA staff will factor into the review. We also note that the companion policy to multilateral instrument 61101 recommends that an issuer implement an independent special committee for all conflict of interest transactions. The independent, the independent committee should be like an arm's length bargaining agent for minority shareholders. So there are certain exemptions available to issuers with respect to formal valuation and or minority approval requirements in certain conflict of interest transactions. And these are listed on the slide. We encourage issuers to review the parameters of the available exemptions to determine if they are available to them when contemplating their next proposed transaction. And now I will pass it over to my colleague, Steve. Our next topic is on cryptocurrency offerings, specifically CSA Staff Notice 46307, which discusses cryptocurrency offerings. On August 24, 2017, the staff of the Canadian Securities Administrators published CSA Staff Notice 46307, Cryptocurrency Offerings. More specifically, this notice was authored by the CSA Regulatory Sandbox which was formed in February 2017 and is an initiative of the CSA to support financial technology or fintech businesses seeking to offer innovative products, services, and applications in Canada. The notice was published in response to requests from fintech businesses and their legal counsel for guidance on what obligations may apply under Canadian securities laws, including whether particular coins or tokens that may be offered by these businesses are or would be considered securities. We note that the notice is consistent with publications by other jurisdictions, including the SEC's report on the DAO and the application of U.S. federal security laws to coin slash token offerings, which was issued on July 25th, 2017. We also note that our investor office published an investor piece to raise awareness on the potentially high-risk nature 
of cryptocurrency offerings on September 7th, 2017. The notice focuses on three topics. Initial coin offerings or initial token offerings, commonly referred to as ICOs or ITOs, and for the purpose of this presentation will be collectively referred to as ICOs, cryptocurrency investment funds, and lastly, cryptocurrency exchanges. Cryptocurrency offerings. By way of background, ICOs are a new way of capital raising generally used by startup businesses to raise capital from investors who are often retail investors. In this sense, many ICOs resemble initial public offerings or IPOs because capital raised is used to execute a business plan. And the coins or tokens that are subscribed for are similar to traditional equity in a business as their value often depends on how successful that business performs. However, unlike IPOs of common shares, these coins or tokens generally do not represent equity in a company. Moreover, as ICOs are conducted over the internet, in some cases, the only information collected from investors is an IP or email address. Now, many fintechs have argued that coins or tokens are software products or utility tokens and therefore not securities. However, when the totality of the ICO or arrangement is considered, the ICO products or tokens may be viewed legally as securities. For example, in response to numerous inquiries, we have found that the coins or tokens in question constituted securities for the purposes of securities laws on the basis that they are quote unquote investment contracts. In arriving at this conclusion, we've considered relevant case law, which requires an assessment of the economic realities of a transaction and the purposive interpretation with the objective of investor protection in mind. There is a four prong test that businesses should apply in determining whether or not an investment contract exists. Specifically, an ICO or other business should consider whether there is an investment of money in a common enterprise with the expectation of profit that will come significantly from the efforts of others. Where the coins or tokens are considered to be securities, businesses conducting an ICO must identify and address fundamental securities law obligations, including the requirement to distribute the coins or tokens under a prospectus or applicable exemption therefrom, as well as other securities law obligations, including registration and resale. Now, turning our attention to cryptocurrency investment funds, we find that these resemble traditional investment funds, except that portfolios are entirely or mostly composed of cryptocurrencies, such as Bitcoin or Ether, and not a basket of traditional equity securities. The funds allow investors to gain exposure to cryptocurrencies without needing to set up digital wallets, buy cryptocurrencies on their own, which in and of itself can be a difficult process. As securities regulators, we have the same concerns regarding cryptocurrency investment funds as with investment funds generally. However, cryptocurrency raises further considerations and concerns around the suitability of the product for retail investors, what due diligence is performed uh, on the cryptocurrency exchanges used, how will cryptocurrencies in the portfolio and securities of the investment fund be valued, and special expertise may be required to store and keep cryptocurrencies secure. Lastly, I would like to chat briefly about cryptocurrency exchanges. These exchanges allow the purchase and sale of virtual currencies. However, they also allow the purchase and sale of coins and tokens previously distributed pursuant to ICOs, which are in many cases securities. We found that these exchanges typically operate globally in many cases without government oversight. Moreover, significant differences can exist among these exchanges in terms of pricing and identity verification completed for buyers and sellers. It's important to note that, that secondary trading in coins slash tokens on cryptocurrency exchanges may be offside securities law, resale rules, since these usually take place among retail investors without any restrictions. In conclusion, there is more information contained in the notice than discussed today, and listeners are encouraged to read it. Please note that the notice is also available on our website. Moreover, in order to avoid costly regulatory surprises, we encourage businesses with proposed cryptocurrency offerings to contact their local securities regulatory authority to discuss possible approaches to complying with securities laws. 
So that concludes the main topics for today's presentation. But before we proceed to the Q&A, I'd like to draw your attention to the appendix in our slide deck, which contains useful references relating to today's topics, as well as general contact information and contact information for today's presenters. So thank you very much for joining us, and please stay online for the Q&A, which will begin shortly.